The African-American spiritual or the Negro spiritual is highly emblematic of the transfer of African traditions to the antebellum American landscape of human enslavement. The term Negro spiritual or Negro folk music may very well seem derisive for a younger generation of listeners that know little about its evolution from African traditions. But the use of the term Negro within this context is an endearing effort and pays homage to the employment of those folk art forms by an oppressed and abased people to resist and to overcome that oppression and abasement. Therefore, Negro folk music encompasses various forms that evolved out of the antebellum American landscape, from the more familiar Negro spiritual to less familiar forms such as ring games, calls, hollers, shouts, play party songs, work songs, and the blues. There are eight specific characteristics of most of these Negro folk musical forms, especially the Negro spiritual. Those characteristics are critical to note, remember, and focus on when listening to these forms, and they include the various employment of the blue or flatted third and seventh tonality. In traditional singing of these forms, there's no apparent striving for that smooth and sweet vocal quality that is often associated with Western European traditional singing. They utilize expressions such as humming, moaning, and groaning. They alterate or soften ultimate consonants, especially R's and L's, to achieve a desired musical effect. They use call response or leader group patterns. They use syncopation. They implement percussive body sounds such as patting, hand clapping, and stomping as forms of accompaniment. Note that enslaved Africans in America were prohibited from making or using ritualistic drums, and many considered this technique as the need to transfer that ritual to the human body. And finally, they are orally transmitted. As cultural phenomena, we often place the songs of black folklore into either of two broad categories, secular or religious. Such categorization, however, is highly limited because these genres equally share and borrow from a common cultural substratum and repertoire of musical effects. The role assumed by their oral transmission provides a compelling case for viewing this category in its entirety as oral literature. So often we speak of the uh, spiritual as being the African-American uh, black exponent uh, of a uh, of the, of the black man, and we have to admit that it is, and it is certainly from the standpoint of the tradition of, of, of how we have maintained this music. The oral tradition is, is indicative, is characteristic of Africa. We speak of the griot, it's all passed along, uh, the history of Africa and families and so forth. And music, it happened right here in the United States. Because to tell you the truth about it, it is extremely difficult to write those early spirituals the way they were performed, I would imagine. The textual components of these songs represent powerful psychological, sociological, political, and religious commentaries. And songs pass into oral tradition because their texts express matters, feelings, and attitudes on which there is maximal accord. Different meanings derive from the manner in which they are performed, and knowledge of their source is essential to fully grasping their meaning. It is unfortunate that traditional examinations have ignored the genre's import as aesthetic objects, and instead focus on more superficial characteristics, such as their places of origination, composition, phonetic and grammatical properties, and performative practices. 
As a participatory art, the value of any music is in direct proportion to an individual's depth of participation. And participation is possible only through listening. Whether partaking as a member of an audience, composing, reading, analyzing, or performing, one is required to hear the music before assigning any reasonable meaning to it. Of all the dimensions of aesthetic experience, the dimension of meaning is the least amenable to systematic analysis and empirical verification. This is not to say that verbalization about what these songs mean should be avoided, but to insist that all such referential statements be referred back to perceivable components within the songs themselves. According to some early psychological investigations, there are certain aspects of music which will induce the same emotional state in many people under varying conditions. For example, the fact that music is sad, joyous, or dignified in such instances is not a matter of chance, but of the choices of specific musical devices. There are certain ways of organizing musical structures. For example, uh, one very common uh, technique that you find in, in, in all music is, is the sequence. That particular scale is found just about everywhere. You find that in Asian cultures, you find that in African cultures, and you find that also in, in European cultures. That pattern, you know, the, those, those intervals are just very easy to sing. And it's important for people to understand that music theorists come after the fact. They don't come before the fact. And what music theorists, such as myself, try to do is to make sense out of somebody else's creative process. But that creative process can be very interesting and it can go into avenues that you would not expect, strophic form, which, which involves a lot of repetition. You are basically using the same melody for different lines of text. And by using a technique like that, is putting more emphasis on the words than he or she is on the melodic aspect, but it's quite a natural process and doesn't require musical training to be able to do that. The whole point, regardless if the music is very simple or very complex, is that it's trying to communicate something. And uh, the power of communication is the key. Various examinations have contributed to the historiography and narrative of the spiritual and provide evidence that the genre actually predates the American Revolution. The habitat which precipitated the development and evolution of the genre was certainly well established within the American landscape of the 17th century. Dina Epstein refers to a type of lamentation singing which was practiced by Africans captured by the Portuguese in 1444. However, America traditionally expressed little ownership of this mode of expression, which it considered crude, primitive, and savage. The most eloquent first-hand commentary on these songs was provided in 1855 by Frederick Douglass. He asserted that slaves were expected to sing as well as work, since this was a primary and trenchant means of informing the overseer of their location as well as their progress. He spoke of singing improvisations which appeared as simple jargon to oppressors while holding significant meaning for the oppressed. Douglas was describing testifying and for him these theodicy centered expressions spoke to the hearts and souls of the thoughtful. He further asserted that these songs represented sorrow rather than joy and served as a primary healing force to a people enduring the worldly conditions of abasement and oppression. W.E.B. Du Bois convincingly articulates the neglected status of these expressions. For Du Bois, Negro folk music 
represented the only American folk music, and he remained deeply concerned that America refused to acknowledge, claim, and preserve it. Various scholarly debates regarding the origins and factors which enkindled the genre have centered around the influence of African versus European musical and religious traditions. The Negro spiritual was often a song of social protest, whereas the white spiritual never was.